Um, I'm not the official lost and found guy, but there is a phone that was left out there. Uh, there's a handsome looking dude with a sign that says music on the, on the screen. So if someone's missing a cell phone, we have it up here. John, do I have the thumbs up from you to get started, or? Yeah, why don't you? All right. Uh-oh. Uh, it's my cell phone. Yes. <laughs> So thanks everybody for coming back. Um, we're going to get started with our breakout summaries with our leaders. And uh, um, I'm one of the moderators with Zoe Stewart-Lewis. She's my co-moderator for this session. And we'll get started maybe on the right-hand side and uh, keep on going towards the center. And then we'll continue along this side. Uh, we will have a timer. And you'll hear it go off when it's time for you to stop um, if you don't stop by then. So we'll get going. All right. Um, Hi, Rick Haas, uh, again with Gift of Life. Uh, we had the OPO uh, professionals uh, along with uh, Sean Van Slyke. Uh, so the, and these are in no, no particular uh, order, uh, but one of the things we wanted to make sure is that we replaced uh, the definition of an eligible donor uh, and start thinking about um, what is that potential uh, for donation. Uh, and to get there, uh, really looking at how we can uh, come up with some common definitions uh, so we can begin collecting this. Uh, and you know, the OPOs have the data. If we have a common, uh, common definition, uh, we can really accelerate this. And you know, one of the requests was, uh, as Jan had talked about, was working with the SRTR, the National Quality um, uh, Forum, to really start getting this work completed so we can, we can really fast track that. And if we're gonna get rid of eligible, we have to have something uh, to replace it with. And because that really then begins, if we know what potential is, we can really better understand how effective and where the process improvement can be, whether it's the referral rate, the donation rate, the authorization rate, DCD, brain dead, uh, however you may want, want to look at it. We also thought it was important that that data also be provided at that hospital level so that it's not just an OPO performance metric, but we can also be able to have that for individual hospitals to see how well they're performing uh, in the donation space. And should there be any regulatory framework or lever we need to pull there uh, to make sure that we're all accountable uh, to those, that, those patients in our community who need transplants. Uh, we also thought that we should start not maybe not talking about organ discards, but really look at it from organ utilization. Organ discard with the negative is really an, uh, sometimes an abdominal problem uh, and not a thoracic problem, right? We, we should be really looking at organ utilization uh, and if we have that potential to better understand that. We like the ODE, but if there can be something we can do with the time lag uh, that we're looking at, you know, trying to, I think, with what Lloyd had talked about, looking backwards on, but you may have made changes since, since that time. And then finally, uh, measuring uh, the effectiveness. Uh, really, we had some good quality uh, process people in our breakout uh, to talk about, you know, really process mapping that donation process and doing a gap analysis to look at the data that we currently collect uh, that we can use and then the data that we may need to better uh, and be more efficient. And really from the whole continuum of donor evaluation, management, allocation, transportation, uh, and the scheduling. So uh, those were the things that we talked about and hopefully I'm under time. Universal thing that everyone wants uh, a replacement for eligible donors, OPOs, transplant capacity. Thank you very much. And on the next, our next uh, Great. All right. Are you skipping me, James? Oh, James is going to skip me. I've been thinking you're just running the show. I just thought <laughs> you this up here. No, Snyder gets to talk. Uh, I, yeah, I actually am going to report. So I was uh, also the OPO group, but on the virtual breakout. So uh, it's good I'm sitting here next to Rick. And our themes were very similar. Our top priority agreed with Rick's uh, better definition of donor potential should be a critical element that we work on as a community. Both, our group felt both uh, better capture and reporting of donor potential within the OPO's EMR systems that could be standardized and uh, 
captured within the OPTN uh, system, but also automated referrals of in-hospital deaths. If that was a requirement of hospitals uh, for or a condition of participation, that there's an automated referral mechanism with standardized capture of ICD-10 diagnostic and procedure codes um, that could serve as a, a, a basis for reporting of donor potential in conjunction with the OPO's EMR data. So that was the top priority from our group. Uh, number two is more granular data capture on the timing of organ offers, the timing of organ declines, and the, um, particularly around late declines. Uh, we had a lot of discussion around this, but we need, in order to drive quality improvement and better public reporting, we felt that uh, we needed better data on the timing so that we could study ways that we could improve the efficiency of the allocation system. So, for example, better timing on when centers are made primary on an offer and how long they, it takes to respond, uh, more granular data on um, the requirements around when those declines are put into the system. Third was uh, predictive analytics tools, uh, particularly around the probability of transplant. The group recognized that the uh, SRTR already provides what we call a donor yield calculator for OPOs to use. Many of them have that built into their EMR uh, systems. Uh, but they felt, they felt that a, a tool that was publicly available on the website where you enter in the donor's information and the tool provides uh, the prediction for whether those organs would be transplanted or discarded would be useful. Um, <clears throat> and some predictive, uh, we had two donor family members on the call, um, which was very informative. They felt that the donor families want better information on the predicted longevity of the organs if transplanted, um, not just for any donor, but for a donor like their loved one. You know, what could we do, what could we provide that says, on average, these organs, if they're successfully transplanted, will last this long in those recipients. Uh, and then finally, the group supported removing the eligible death reporting. Uh, even in advance of coming up with a better donor potential, they felt that that uh, eligible death reporting was probably um, more misleading than helpful. So, okay. Thank you. A lot of echoed thoughts. James? Great. So uh, our group, uh, so myself and Amin uh, Tabatabai were uh, moderating and we were on the what payers want to know and we were fortunate that we had Julie Watts and Christy Warren, Warren, Warren from Humana and uh, Varun Saxena from Kaiser um, participating in our group. We also had uh, transplant administrators, quality folks, um, other transplant professionals and it was uh, a very good discussion. We, we I think we echoed again on the theme around the wait list um, outcomes, uh, having a, an understanding of the referral to listing, listing to eval, uh, eval to wait list, uh, wait list to transplant uh, data, right, and getting a little bit deeper in that area. Um, uh, uh, there was a specific uh, request on uh, what, is the, what is the transplant selection criteria, right, and so having that data uh, and, and information may be more readily available, uh, although maybe not directly from the program, but in another fashion. Um, I was really encouraged about this, and there's just a, a desire for more ongoing dialogue, and, and really, uh, you know, the, the, the comment made by the payers was, you know, we need the experts to have a discussion on what are the best, if one year graph survival or, or, you know, those types of outcomes aren't the best, what are the best outcomes to be looking at um, uh, transplant center performance? And, and then um, also wanting to look at medication coverage for patients, right? Um, so uh, looking at compliance, loss of coverage, um, maybe the percentage of their income, right? And like what's, what is that impact on those patients? Uh, and also, you know, as they move from payer to payer, you know, is there, is there any sort of loss of coverage or, or need to change immunosuppression medications, things like that. Uh, we also looked at um, a, few other, a few other areas, but those were the, those were the ones that were um, prioritized. Great, thank you. Corey? Hi, I was uh, one of the moderators along with uh, Grace Leiden, who uh, was joining me to discuss uh, information important for payers. This was one of the virtual groups. Uh, I think we had a really uh, productive conversation. At the same time, I think some of the 
uh, discussion resolved, re revolved around you know, stories that reflected interactions with payers. And this was the reality that a majority of the participants were not payers. Uh, and so, you know, we, I, I think that's, I think some of the discussion that, that, that really kind of uh, rose to the, the front. Uh, for example, one of the uh, participants had been uh, seeking to be a living donor um, and the uh, uh, evaluation required additional testing, genetic testing, but that testing was, was not covered. Uh, and so I think it, it definitely points to both the need for uh, discussions for payers specific to living donors, as well as candidates and recipients. Uh, there was another story um, specific to uh, a candidate who had been uh, a long time dialysis patient. Uh, and in order to uh, provide the opportunity for that candidate to be listed, their community actually did a GoFundMe so that the center could see that that patient had sufficient resources. Uh, and so this isn't necessarily specific to data, but it just speaks to how intertwined some of these issues are. Uh, we did touch on a few uh, specifics around uses of data, um, and I think there hopefully can be some uh, expansion on this in the discussion tomorrow. We kept this, I think, uh, at a fairly high level. Um, but data could potentially be used to inform coverage decisions uh, and one specific mechanism would be to standardize the process of expert opinion or expert panels that are used by payers um, to inform, uh, you know, denied coverage or coverage of, of hard cases. Uh, we touched on the uh, issue of um, how coverage could impact uh, risk aversion specific to uh, if a center perceives that a uh, medically complex patient might cost more uh, and how that, um, you know, interaction with coverage uh, could impact access to transplant. Um, we touched on impacts of uh, pediatric patients and how that is really a family impact and how there could be data on impacts of pediatric patients on the family. Um, there was definitely an interest in long-term outcomes, both for living donation and recipients, as well as uh, information provided uh, specific to quality of life to help inform uh, payer decisions. And then there was also an interest in um, resources. Uh, in addition to data, uh, one example was resources to guide patients and centers as they navigate their um, journey and interact with payers throughout that journey. Thanks, Corey. David? So I was... Uh, pleased to moderate with Osama and the discussion of uh, what providers want. I'd say there were sort of three big buckets, data we didn't have but would like, data we have but don't analyze, and data we analyze but need to be presented differently. Um, in the first bucket, um, I think Nancy threw down the gauntlet and I think in the right thing, which is we really don't understand the true burden of disease out there. And that, you know, we look at even, even starting at something like dialysis, we're missing a whole lot of people that have end-stage renal disease or have cirrhosis that we don't even see at the transplant program. So really understanding how well we're serving our population requires new data collection that we really should be aspirational for. Uh, on a more granular level, we talked about the lack of really good understanding of, and objective ways of looking at psychosocial and particularly psychiatric conditions and how those impact both likelihood of listing and outcomes and that we spend a lot of time thinking about things like BMI and, you know, diabetes and that sort of stuff, but we don't think about many of these other things that absolutely impact patients' ability to care for their organs and get listed, and we could work on that. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about data that we have but don't particularly re re report on. So people wanted to know, you know, rates of listing and success of listing as well as success and outcomes by specific conditions um, at the center level. Um, and so both from a process improvement standpoint, how well do we get uh, patients of specific race and ethnicities and high risk groups uh, through evaluation to listing and how well do they do afterwards and how can we deploy things that would help them do better. I think one of the corollaries of that is how can we identify centers of excellence and communicate that to referring providers so that patients with those specific conditions have an opportunity to access care um, that would be uniquely beneficial to them. And the, perce the perception is whether it's the transplant center's responsibility, the referring doctor's responsibility, or the transplant systems, but people aren't finding out that there are opportunities to get care and are potentially foregoing the opportunities for transplant, and I think we could do better. 
Um, and then I, th I think the last, well, two more points. The, the what data do we have but we're not really reporting in ways that we think are productive, we don't think that the current reporting really protects innovation and that we collect a lot of data and but we don't really carve out um, opportunities and protections for, for innovation. We report things at a level of precision that we don't actually have which leads to um, risk aversion behavior and, and concerns um, both on patients, providers, and potentially our concerns about what the payers may think about it. So, you know, can we report it in a way that actually reflects the degree of certainty that we do or don't have about it and that conveys the important information that centers are functioning a level that it's acceptable um, but doesn't penalize centers and make them worry about one and two points. Uh, and then I think the final thing we talked about was wanting to have some granular data on periprocedural complications. We brought up the idea of transcript, whether this is becomes an SRTR thing or something in the community, but we all at the surgeon level really and the provider level would like to know on a, at a granular level what contributes to good and bad outcomes. And again, this should probably be data that's for quality improvement that's reported to the center directors, may not make it out to the um, public um, as long as the, you know, the overall success rates are good, but would really help us as we do our jobs. So thank you. John Miller with the SRTR, and I was uh, moderating a virtual session with Darren Stewart from the regulator perspective. Um, and actually, I think I'm the first to talk about regulators, but a lot of um, similar ideas already have come up with the OPOs and the and the providers. So three big um, three big themes that we saw. The first of which was uh, regulators are are wanting to move. Um, more towards uh, centered improvement type metrics rather than being seen as punitive. So I think there's been a, a fair bit of talk uh, about that already. And um, similar to, to I think what we've heard both from the OPOs and the providers side was that um, a, a second big theme was more granularity <coughs> uh, in the data. Again, recognizing that some of these may be quality improvement, but some of them may raise to the level of um, of, of metrics that are looked at by regulators. And, and some examples of these on, on either side was that uh, post-transplant is currently, um, you know, the one-year outcome is, uh, is the big metric, and that's kind of a, a yes or no, is there a one-year event, yes or no. And uh, there was interest in seeing uh, more granularity, quality of life. Um, you know, for example, the, the um, one-year outcome could be 365 days on a ventilator and then died on the 366th day was one of the examples that was brought up. Um, and then on the offer acceptance side, too, there was uh, interest in uh, more granularity around the offer acceptance beyond just the yes, no, was it a late decline, um, and, and so forth. Uh, and. Um, Similar as well was looking at at places upstream from where uh, where data is already collected or where there are already regulatory metrics. Uh, so moving into uh, into how is how would metrics be uh, rolled out for regulators in terms of referrals, both of uh, possible donors as well as um, possible transplant candidates. And there was some discussion around the end stage renal disease treatment choice as being a possible uh, pilot program that may be um, creating some of those uh, metrics that might be of interest in the uh, in the pre-listing uh, space as well. So. Right. So I'm Sean Penny, transplant cardiologist from University of Chicago, and had the pleasure of moderating this session with Dirk Slater from Optum, and we were uh, very lucky to have a, a number of payers in our group. We were exploring what information was important for payers uh, along the entire transplant spectrum. So not only did we have Dirk from Optum, we had John Friedman, who previously was of Optum, and also Todd from CMS. And so we had an opportunity to really engage uh, along a dialogue, and so a lot of the conversation went back and forth between what payers want to know and also what patients and providers want insurance companies and, and payers to know. So one of the first comments was that uh, it was important uh, to measure uh, employee satisfaction and enrollee satisfaction with the engagement with the uh, payers. How do you measure that? Uh, but it's important to know whether or not individual uh, uh, individuals are, are having a good uh, experience with their uh, payer. 
Payers also said that they want to avoid the CNN effect. We certainly heard about that earlier in comments from Dirk. Uh, it was brought up, you want to avoid the LA Times, you want to avoid the New York Times, the Washington Post, Congress from CMS, as well as CNN. So I think we heard that point loud and clear. Um, there was a, a lot of talk about um, it, it making it important for payers to know how expensive drugs are, and that sometimes may be a resource to engage with those persons who lose a pharmacy benefit or may not necessarily be refilling their medications because of the stigma of asking their parents for a particular pediatric population or not having the financial wherewithal if you're just starting your life to be able to pay for medicines. We talked about the need for both sides of the transplant process to be more educated, that payers need to be educated about what patients and providers are going through and that patients and providers might want to listen to also what it's like from a payer perspective. So along those lines, we thought it would be important that there's a role for professional societies, particularly those that advocate for patients in the transplant system, engage with payers to have some of that dialogue and also be advocates for patients. We talked a lot about transparency and the need for uniformity when it comes to establishing criteria for centers of excellence so that um, providers know what it takes to be a center of excellence, uh, but that there also may need to be some exceptions to that when you're talking about taking care of special populations, whether that's a pediatric population or a rural population, where maybe you don't need to be held to the exact same standard as other centers. So a couple things that really resonated with our group. We thought it was very, very important to increase the coverage for long-term support of transplant patients, looking at value across a longer time period, not just around the, the episode around the transplant, but looking over years of coverage. The other thing is that we felt that it was important for payers to develop strategies for high-risk patients, something that we just heard a couple minutes ago. Payers want us as transplant centers to be able to transplant higher risk candidates, but it's also important that there be some protection that, um, that we know as transplant centers that payers will still pay for those high risk patients, even if outcomes suffer as a result of that, something along the lines of, of the COIN project. So it was a very good discussion, and uh, I think that summarizes most of the key points. Richard Leica and I had a regulatory uh, group. I had Jesse Scholl as my co-moderator, and sh although Sharon Shepard doesn't want to be identified as a regulator, she might be the only regulator we had in the room. Um, so we actually started off by defining who the regulators were. We thought that was important, and we decided that relevant to us, it would be CMS, the OPTN, payers, and the Department of Public Health, and then we discussed what their you know agendas would be or what they would want to regulate. And um, we came to the conclusion that probably some uniformity to the extent possible, if those organizations could have a more aligned understanding of what they wanted, that might make our lives um, easier as transplant professionals. We then got into an interesting conversation about um, the fact that uh, as transplanters, we have this dual fiduciary role. We have the patients we serve and we have society that we serve. And we had many conversations about how that could happen, but I think it, it sort of permeates what we're going to discuss because to a large extent the regulators fill the role of society in that sort of tension between um, you know who, who, who's, who takes precedence. Um, we then identified six domains that the regulators would probably be most interested in um, and the first one would be safety and when we, we got to safety we decided we had to define safety I think you can think of this as analogous to the word good, right? If I were to tell you I have a good car, you might understand in your mind what I'm talking about. But if I said to you, my car is the good car in the parking lot, please go get it for me, you wouldn't know which car I was talking about. So we decided to define safety. Uh, we generated a large list of safety items. Uh, basically, in our discussion, we removed the never events as being part and parcel of what is safety, but then I think the conversation could be sent around safety for who? Is it safety for the person who receives the organ or safety for the person waiting for the organ? In that context, we came up with a discussion of balancing outcomes with the need to do transplants and perhaps the first actionable item for the community to think about is it, should we be thinking about limiting graft failures, trying to have the least number of graft failures as a safety definition or should there be 
not enough graft failures because that means you're losing people untransplanted. And where is that line or where is that tension? So how do we balance outcomes with the need to do transplants? Uh, in regards to outcomes in general, I think our one actionable discussion there was w we would like to see outcomes tailored to specific organ types and you know types of patients, whether it's pediatrics and adults, having not a one-size-fits-all definition to outcomes and success. We had a lot of conversation around uh, system integrity, uh, and under system integrity, we sort of put resource utilization, and there's a long list of resource utilization items that could be could be collected, like length of stay, uh, return to the OR, readmissions, how those would actually be used in a way that didn't result in unintended consequences. We couldn't we couldn't really conclude, but we thought that was up for discussion. But we really did like everybody else, center around organ discard and, and organ offer acceptance ratios as something that we want to explore more. Uh, we had a discussion about innovation. Regulators want innovation, particularly the payer portions of the, of the regulators. And the big item, um, to <laughs> other people didn't use as much of their time. So the idea would be to come up with a way to create a safe space for transplanters to try to innovate without fear of regulation. That has been a recurring theme almost since I started in transplant in 1999. So I think it's time that we address that in a full way. And lastly, there was equity. And, and under equity, we would like to see more transparency of selection criteria. And particularly, it might not matter so much in the Northeast, getting to what we were talking about earlier, but in places where there's only one transplant program, you have to balance the, that with geography. So that's what we talked about. I love the fact that Guns N' Roses cut off Rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Allison Hart. I've uh, moderated the group about uh, what transplant professionals want to know, along with Karen Ledeen and Heather Hunt. And so I think for us, one of the striking themes is that transplant professionals, in addition to patients, also want things like information and tools. Um, in addition to talking about metrics, so I think that that's an important thing to call out. I'm also really glad that we're talking about this in this very multidis multidisciplinary environment because we, too, there was a lot of interest in new data elements, not only new data elements, uh, but the ability to more rapidly incorporate and, and, dis and uh, bring in new data elements, um, including and, and called out specifically social determinants of health data collection, so that was uh, one of the main themes in our group, um, the ability to more rapidly update risk adjustment based on what we realize are new data elements that we need to collect. There was a desire for outcome predictions for this organ for this patient, so tools to help programs make decisions at the bedside, uh, a need to find a way to allow programs to take risks with factors that are unadjusted for, so for data elements, for things that are not currently in risk adjustment, while we work on perhaps new data elements, but also, again, think about ways to promote innovation. Um, there was a desire for better long-term disease-specific outcomes, both to improve post-transplant management and counseling, and, and in particular on the pediatric side, again, um, one- and five-year outcomes, a lot different meaning for a 10-month-old than a 65-year-old, perhaps. And a desire for living donor outcomes, long-term living donor outcomes, both uh, so that a program can track their own living donor outcomes, but also for counseling. Dr. Hart and I are going to switch without falling off the stage here. Um, th thank you. I'm Chris Delenti, and I was honored to co-moderate a virtual professional session with Dr. Kosiski, and our observations really reinforce a number of the themes that we've heard, but we did consider bypass on the subway. And looking upstream, there was substantial interest in moving upstream and expanding the denominator, collecting information on referrals to transplant centers, as Dr. Patzer has been doing so much work on. And as the corollary to that, there was an interest in data to compute expected referral rates and for kidney, considering both from the perspective of patients on dialysis, but also to try to capture the denominator for preemptive listings and with critical attention to equity and access by social determinants of health. There was also interest in gathering information to estimate referral conversions to listing and to transplant by center, by patient characteristics, and we had substantial discussion around characteristics like high BMI and other risk traits, both medical and psychosocial. And then there was an emphasis on need for similar information on living donor candidate acceptance as we discussed this morning. 
Uh, we did have some discussion of multi-listing. It was, um, there was a uh, interest in making that option more accessible to patients and it was thought that the SRTR might provide op um, information on other centers that would be suitable for the, the patient to help support access to that option. Uh, we discussed information about um, offers and there was the comment particularly from our surgeons about centers struggling with the volume of offers in the new allocation system and so as an application a call for maybe an approach by the um, SRTR and OPTN to try to tailor offers by the likelihood of actually receiving that, that organ. There was a requ request for offers to include uh, data on expected outcomes based not just on donor characteristics but to try to integrate both the donor and recipient characteristics in making that risk prediction and then for a given candidate to try to get better estimates of the time to the next offer if an offer is declined. And then we did ask the patient perspective on offers. There is a lot of discussion in the community about transparency and perhaps patients wanting information on, on every offer that they um, could have received. Interestingly, our patient said that they, perhaps too much information can feel burdensome to some patients and was interested in really the information that they could do something about, so one perspective. Uh, focusing on the perioperative um, period, there was a comment made on a better definition of delayed graft function, and of note, the National Kidney Foundation has just worked on a consensus conference on that topic, so we can look, look to those results. And finally, with regard to long-term follow-up, we did have some discussion about how long centers should be collecting information um, beyond death and graft failure, particularly when patients have graduated back to the referring providers. We didn't reach a uh, the specific consensus in that regard, but there was a note and emphasis on the importance of comprehensive outcomes, so quality of life, how well are patients living with their allograft, as well as the importance of capturing complications of immunosuppression, such as cancer and other complications, so thank you. All right, great. So Rachel Patzer, Emery, um, and I had the pleasure of co-moderating with Molly McCarthy, um, one of the virtual groups, and we focused on transplant providers. So um, I'm gonna try to highlight just the top few things because a lot of um, what we discussed has already been said. Um, but we spent a little bit of time talking about, um, well, a decent amount of time talking about uh, equity and access and some of the data um, that's really key to um, looking at um, early access to transplant among all organs and patient populations, including uh, referral um, evaluation and waitlisting, um, as s knowing some of that data is, is not currently collected and, and advocating for that. Uh, we also talked a bit about um, uh, several different types of kind of risk prediction models and the transplant providers, and we had a group mostly of transplant providers, and we did have some patient representation. Um, but the transplant providers really wanted better data and models on several different things, and this seemed to be a theme with a few different um, of the models, and we emphasized um, a couple of top ones. One was around prediction of sort of um, organ offers and what's the next better offer, what do I do about this patient that may be on the waiting list, should I accept this offer or not, um, but better data on, on, on that and better models on that, um, as well as um, dynamic models of, of life expectancy. Um, and we spend a bit of time talking about kind of dynamic versus static models where a lot of our models are, um, we're limited by the data we have, which may be at one point in time, but in reality, um, the situation changes over time. So if someone, we may wanna know um, uh, life expectancy at the time of uh, referral. We might wanna know that at the time that a patient is going through the evaluation, uh, but that may change as the patient is listed, as, as different things are happening, COVID happens. There's a lot that we might need to update uh, more uh, in a more dynamic fashion. So that was a theme across several of the models that we talked about. Um, and we had a few other, uh, a few other things we talked about. Um, so one thing was the silos between referring providers and transplant programs um, and having, uh, prioritizing some sort of information and communication uh, between the referring providers and um, the transplant programs um, and having some kind of system where uh, the uh, referring providers could have that referral and the evaluation and some of this information sort of tracked and then know the communication, um, what's going on. A lot of uh, referring providers may be asking the transplant centers, well, where is my patient on the list or what's their status or why wasn't my patient placed on the waiting list? So having that communication platform was something we talked about um, would be good information. Um, and we talked a bit about 
um, other tools for um, a lot of our transplant providers, we heard this several times, some of the transplant providers needing better tools for using for their quality programs, um, kind of a, you know, using for quality monitoring or having some sort of transplant col collaborative where we're focusing more on improving the quality. And we heard from our transplant providers that they're just really tired of spending their quality meetings um, focused on the worry about flagging and um, you know, a risk of aversion and instead being able to really focus on quality um, and tools for being able to do that. So, and I, I, we had a lot more that we discussed, but I'll, I'll stop there. It was a really great discussion. Um, so go on. Um, I had the opportunity to moderate the transplant professionals group with Rio uh, the nice thing about going last is I can just say we said everything that they said. <laughs> um, so I'll be very brief. It's, um, there was a lot of discussion about the need for better risk adjustment, uh, both on the wait list and for outcomes. Uh, an example that, was, that we talked about at length was the cardiovascular data uh, and the fact that it's not absent and whether, there are, you know, whether surrogates are enough and whether it needs to be independent. Uh, we talked about the need for social determinants of health um, and measures of equity, um, tools about organ acceptance, uh, decision support tools, and trying to identify which patients would actually benefit from an organ and perhaps better and more efficient matching in the allocation system itself to kind of decrease the number of organ offers that people are dealing with. Data quality and standardization of definitions was a, was a big piece of that. Um, Weightless management insights, uh, helping programs manage and understand what's happening on their wait list and what's going on, which led to also a co conversation about better communication with referring providers, particularly in the kidney space where patients are being managed by a different set of providers. Um, there was certainly a desire to see better uh, and more granular information about our OPO practices, specifically around late offers, timing of offers, declines, um, you know, these missed procurements or non-procurement opportunities and the confusion around biopsy practices and how uh, the absence of standardization adversely impacts the ability to interpret some of this data. Um, and that, you know, we want to try to avoid measures that are gameable, um, you know, depending on how they're, or at least be cautious about how some of these measures are presented uh, broadly to the community. And I'll stop there. We actually have one more group. Um, Ian Jamison represented a group that was going over regulatory stuff. There wasn't room on the stage, so we'll sneak them up. Sorry, folks, I left my seat. <laughs> so we, we um, our group, and co-led with um, Lloyd Ratner and myself, we were talking about uh, uh, information for regulators and similar to Dr. Formica's group. Uh, a lot of focus on patient safety as well as uh, trust with the system. We had had just a nice selection of uh, attendees from transplant hospitals, from ASTS, from MPSC, from UNOS, from HHS, where we had Shannon Dunn and Frank uh, Holloman. What really jumped out and slapped me in the face was the discussion as to who are the regulators. Dr. Formica mentioned, obviously, HRSA and MPSC. But there's others, there's state regulators. You know, some states have a, a strong uh, environment where, for instance, New York City, state regulators are often the first in the transplant center when there are, there are problems. But uh, also, you know, within HRSA, you have the CDC, you have the NIH, you have FDA, you even have the Veterans uh, Administration. They all play into the regulatory uh, aspect. But a big aha moment that came up in our group was discussion about how a transplant hospital uh, or health system is also in effect a regulator. If your uh, program and your volume goes down, then that could directly impact the level of resources uh, that could be uh, provided to that program. Whereas if you're the crown jewel and, and a large program and um, sort of the front and center of a health system, then you might attract many more resources. So, you know, you're facing those regulatory components within your own health system. From a top-down perspective, we really wanted to look at, well, what drives programs to run afoul uh, of regulators? And um, 
you know, we've discussed many of these metrics ad nauseum over the past day and a half, but, but really the intent is to guard against the false positives where truly a program should not be flagged. And, and how do we avoid that? And how do we develop the information set to allow us to get better decision making as to minimizing those false positives? Just a final note that, that I really wanted to, to focus on was data integrity. And, and how can that be even further regulated, regulated um, so that it can be improved, potentially expanded, and truly used as a transplant community to drive performance improvement. We all know we spend an inordinate amount of time documenting unit forms and what have you, but should that be improved? Should that be broadened to help us uh, perform a better job in terms of the regulatory agencies that are asking us to do better. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, what's notable or striking, I think, is the, how the Venn diagrams of what people want to know, whether they're professionals, patients, regulators, opioid professionals, or um, uh, payers, is that the Venn diagram, the intersection, is actually quite large. And that a lot of the uh, interests are overlapped. Now, the metrics themselves may be different, but the interest in what people want to know seems to be very common across not only uh, transplant professionals uh, across centers, but also the, the stakeholders that we talk about. So I think that's an encouraging thing. There are things that are off to the side uh, that aren't in the intersection of all those groups, but there's certainly a lot of commonality uh, in terms of what all the uh, stakeholders want to know. Um, they may want it in a different form. They may want it uh, in a private or pu public fashion, but I think that's an encouraging uh, note to all these breakout sessions so far is that there's more commonality than not. So I think that's an encouraging thing. Zoe, did you want to make comments before we take questions from the audience? No, I would echo what you were saying, though. It did strike me. <laughs> the Venn diagram is well put. Um, there was just so much overlap between the different stakeholders, and I think, you know, there's definitely more that unifies us, and it's, it's going to be a question of, I think, drilling down on you know, the format and how we best disseminate the information to the different stakeholders. Right. So. Even what the OPO professionals want, and I think it's, for example, universal that nobody likes the definition of el eligible donors, and that seems uh, like a uh, universal sentiment, that things like late declines and the centers that participate in them or some of the practices of OPOs that actually promote organ discard or actually organ non-utilization, which is probably a much better metric than discard, um, are these the things that we can actually ask uh, OPTN to mandate that is collected by o OPO and published by uh, either OPTN or, um, or SRT or in terms of uh, center's uh, rate of late declines and the timing. So we need to be able to good put timestamps on DonorNet and you know, perhaps enhance some of the data collection that occurs from uh, that software. But that, that, that's really an IT problem as opposed to anything else. So thanks for that. Uh, we'll take this opportunity now for anyone who participated in breakouts and wanted to put additional thoughts, and we had to all prioritize our thoughts uh, as the moderators, but uh, we know that there's a lot of other good ideas that were spoken about, and, um, and we'll give the opportunity to have folks get up and uh, speak. So go ahead. Uh, Milton Mitchell. Yes, we had a wonderful breakout, and I made some suggestions also to Allison. She'll bring that up later on, but... Um, glad to see that you brought up the issue of the uh, medications. Free transplant, I wasn't on that much medication, but I had to take certain medications because they had to put a ICD over my heart. But after I had the transplant, I was doing well. I still had to take life-saving medications. So you have to deal with the insurance company, and you have to deal with the pharmacy. You have to deal with yourself, you have to deal with your family, you have to deal with the cost. So I'm glad to see you brought it up because I take microphenolate and I also take tacrolimus. And I take those brands and I hope it doesn't come to a day where I have to take some lower generic brand because I can't foot the cost. So I really think you need to think uh, about how the tacrolimus and microphenolate drugs you know, long-term effects and the cost and the patients themselves that want to do well want to continue to take their medications. 
but it does cost. And we always want to take the best medications. We don't want someone to come up with some medication that maybe will keep us alive for a few days, but won't keep us alive for a lot of days. But the insurance companies, I didn't see them here today, or maybe they are, and I don't know they're here, but that's one of the biggest issues that I had of over eight years. I haven't really missed any payments with them. I've been blessed in that part, but there was a couple of times where I did, had to call them up and let them know I need my medications, and whether the paperwork was lost or whatever the case may be, I need my medication. So I think those issues have to be looked as well in terms of how the policies may be written between the transplant centers and the different pharmacies of making sure that if we're doing the right thing, we need our medication and nothing should prevent it or encumber us from taking the best medications. Thank you. Thanks, Milton. I, I would um, echo that the pharmaceutical you know, coverage is a, is a huge issue, certainly speaking from a provider perspective. Um, it was interesting to me, you know, many years ago, uh, you know, one of my coordinators, you know, kind of came to me and discussed, you know, very upset at this patient for being non-compliant um, because they had stopped taking their medications. And it actually had never occurred to her that this individual, it had nothing to do with their, de their desire or ability to be compliant. They were too embarrassed to let us know that they couldn't pay for their medications. Like, it, you know, I, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, you know, what it would be like for a patient to have to come and to actually, you know, tell their, their, their care team that I can't pay for this medication. And for some patients, that's not an easy, you know, thing to do, even though they know what the implication of, of not coming forward is. So um, I, th I think it's a critically important issue we still have a lot of work to do on. Thank you. I'm Lorinda. Um, I'm a liver patient, and I had my transplant four years ago. And I appreciate what Milton said because we have been talking as patients. As patients, we ride this subway. We're the only ones that are on this track the whole time. And we deal with transplant centers and getting approvals. We deal with insurance getting approvals. We have two different sets of rules that we have to follow as a patient. And then, you know, we're told we've got three months to live. When you're going to die, you will take any organ that you're offered. You want a chance to at least try to live. And sometimes I think we miss that as a whole. And for patients, we need to know what, what the direct impact or factors that we can control for a better outcome. We need to see that on a website. We need to see what's important because different areas of the country are gonna have different outcomes and different things that happen just because of eating, food, diet. But when a transplant center has more financial coordinators than they do social workers, that is a problem. So, thank you. So, um, hi, I'm Kevin Fowler. So, um, so the one thing I want to bring up is, is the issue of equity, and that's everyone's popular word today. Um, so, I guess my request coming out of the meeting is that there's something that's like that's a pillar of this meeting, and that it's not just words. So, for example, going back to like Dr. Permanca said, is if you're gonna put that in there as a metric to measure people, are the transplant centers gonna be resourced to accomplish that? And so what I've seen routinely is these policies, there was a final rule issued last December. I called someone I know in the community and I said, what gives with this? And he says, there's no resources behind it. Nothing's gonna happen. So I just think from, a, from the standpoint, if this is a priority, and I think there's a lot of people who are doubt the issue of equity, I'll put my hand up for that, then I hope CMS is gonna put money behind it to allow the transplant centers to do it. So that's my request. So I just like to see something very tangible, resourced. Thanks. I mean, Tabba Tabai here. Um, definitely want to echo the comments made about medication. Um, and I think a lot of that is about let's think of the patient for their entire life, right? The transplant is really a small portion of my life. I mean, I wake up every day. Most days I don't 
think about my transplant anymore. I mean, it's the reality. I mean, I go days and you know, I don't even remember that I have a transplant, but what do I see every day? It's my medication. Um, and I've heard this from most patients that I've interacted with. Um, it's one of the most stressful things that we do deal with. So I think um, from a data collection standpoint, there should be more that we can do around the types of, you know, kind of immunosuppression and types of drugs and just understand what's there. Um, I was shocked post-transplant when I was handed an advent calendar that had four spots for each day and having to do all that. And then that's not even thinking about the cost behind it. At the time, I was lucky that my father was managing a lot of that, but as I grew older, a lot of that came on to me, right? And then with that, changing jobs, moving around, I ended up in a lot of gray areas where I had to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket. I mean, I was lucky that I could afford it um, at those times, but when I was in college, there were times where I couldn't afford it, right? So it ended up costing my parents more, things like that. So I know there's cases um, where data collection could definitely help in that because it's a surprise most of the time post-transplant when you go and there's all these medications and it changes, right? Because our bodies change after transplants, so our conditions change. Certain things come and go, our medications change, and I think that there needs to be some more clarity around that. Um, and I think I'd like to see a little bit of that word medication you know, come up more throughout this conference and as we think about transplant, because it's, it's, it's honestly the biggest part of our lives. So I wanted to continue to uh, emphasize that. Um, but I had some other points that I was actually thinking about last night and this morning, and I think it's a good transition point as we head into tomorrow. Let's imagine a world where we give you the data and all these metrics that you're asking for. Um, and then what I would say is, are all the elements in place to be data-driven or metric-driven, right? Do we know what we want to do with the data, right? Action and goals, because I think that's the key thing there. I've seen so many times where, even in the business world, we've given, we've given the executives all the data, they just didn't know what to do with it, right? So that brought us back to the drawing board and said, okay, before we get the data, before we define the metrics, what are the problems? What do we want to do there? And I think thinking about that, there's three, I, I actually remembered back when I was with Accenture, there was these studies that we would do and it was called closing the data value gap, right? And that was all about getting people, getting companies and getting businesses to, to extract more value out of that data. And there's really three different, three key areas to be data driven, right? One is assess data literacy, which I wanna talk about, and I think that's important with all the different players, right? There's, there's a le level of literacy to reading data. Two, the availability and tools of the data, which I think also relates to some of this data that needs to be merged, so some IT issues. And number three, defining the data or the metrics that each user group needs, which I think is, is what we're doing here, right? So a couple stats around that that I wanted to share was um, when, we, when, we, when Accenture surveyed uh, executives across all these industries, which included academia, healthcare, um, and folks that are represented here, about a third of those executives surveyed said they, um, they're, they're able to create um, measured value from the data. So about two thirds don't know what to do with the data. And that's executives, right? Um, so what about patients? I mean, that's gonna be even, it, it would look, the numbers would look probably even lower for patients. So I think thinking about that, um, we also found that about 17% of the people in healthcare actually had access to the data and tools but also were able to use it with the proficiency compared to a benchmark of about 28% in like science and tech. So I think something, something to think about is all the players here and all the data that we have, what does data literacy look like for everyone, right? Because we can live in a world where AI, data science solves a lot of these issues and we have it, but are we able to actually read the metrics and act on it? So I just kind of wanted to put some of those points out as we think about shifting from what to how tomorrow. So if there's any comments, we'd, we'd love to hear it. Thanks. I think you touched on a lot of great points. I think the data literacy definitely hit on a big thing theme that came out of my morning you know, breakout session where we really spent a lot of time in that session, or not, our group did at least, talking about education. And it goes back to, again, you can have the data, but if no one knows how to use the data, it doesn't matter. And it really was, you know, talking about the need for longitudinal education for all stakeholders. Because again, at different points on the subway that we've been talking about, we all need different education, and, you know, whether you're a provider or you're the pa certainly the patient. So yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah, 
often it's the, the providers are equally in, in, in the dark about how these data elements are derived and how the calculations are done, and that leads to suspicion and concern and, um, and reactions that are not data-driven themselves. So I don't want the patients to think that this is all you guys don't understand and we all do. I will tell you that there are lots of folks in this community who are as snowed by it as we are. And that's something I think SRTR can do a better job in continuing to do to educate people. So thank you for bringing that up. So we have three minutes till we have our next speaker come up, so. Oh, okay, I'll make no, this quick. No, go ahead. Oh, okay, my name is Helen Odour and I'm the trans Transplant Quality Manager at Methodist Dallas. And when I came up here, I came to address the comment from the gentleman about equity, but while you guys were talking about data literacy, I was just telling the folks at the table that I have a six-year-old who likes, you know, kind of looking at the computer over my head, shoulder when I'm working. And one time he actually, I was on the SRTR website and he looked at it and he was like, mommy, what website is this? It's crazy. And then the next <laughs> comment that he made to me just threw me off. He told me, you know what? I prefer the Amazon website because I can go on Siri and get on Amazon and I can put toys in the, in the cart and I can look at the comparison between a Spider-Man toy and it's on a table and he can tell me this one has this color, this specifications. So my six year old pretty much told me he prefers the Amazon website because it's easier for him to navigate and he's able to put toys in the shopping cart and I just have to come and approve and pay. Anyway, I digress. The real reason I came up here was <laughs> to talk about equity. It's not a question but a comment. Um, I read an article about um, the University of Cincinnati had done some research and they actually established something called the Kidney Transplant Equity Index, or KTEI, which examines the number of minority patients transplanted at a kidney transplant center relative to the prevalence of minority patients on dialysis in each center's health service area. So I bring this comment to you know, address the issue of equity, which we've had about for the last one and a half days, that maybe we can leverage some of this data that they're already looking at. So the data is out there somewhere. It's just a matter of how can we leverage this. Maybe we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Maybe we can work with folks like this. And it just might be an issue of, you know, like Rio said earlier, maybe the SRTR can tell you where to get that information. Yeah. Uh, Very thank good you. Point. Yeah. I think that's such an excellent point. I, I think it mentions repeating that we have data on the composition of wait lists uh, at different centers, and we have the composition of the demographics of the folks that live in those areas. So a comparator might be a useful tool for centers to be aware of, and other people as well. Osama, uh, we'll give you the closing uh, I statement. just want to say something. It, it occurred to me when I heard, I mean, that <coughs> maybe one source of data that we never considered is patient data. Maybe the patients need to add data to the SRTR yeah. because <clears throat> they all talk about their medications. I mean, I can tell you from having three medications I have to take from the pharmacy, they can never get them at the same time. So you have to go there 17 times. So if I had 17 medications, it would be a nightmare. Right. So things like that that uh, get included in the, in the, uh, on, on, on our data it's maybe very helpful for them. How often do they have to face financial problems? The other, and, and that ties into one last thing, which is we have an LDAC system, which is a way the government has agreed to help donors, you know, get to become donors, but we have no recipient in LDAC, and that perpetuates this inequity and unfairness in transplantation, because if you don't have the money, <coughs> you lose the transplant, you can't get listed. So maybe that, patient data would be the source to lobby once we have it to get us that recipient NELDAC that allows us to really service those underserved patients because they're poor. That's well, thank you I for that to idea. Say. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it echoes many things we've talked about, uh, including patient reported outcomes, patient driven data, patient centered data, and how we collect it, and uh, a patient portal that folks can go into and enter their own data. So. All these suggestions are going to come up again tomorrow when we talk about the how. So, so thank you very much. We're going to move on immediately to our next uh, end keynote speaker. So, um, we'll transition to that. Now. Okay. Now, again, I realize once again, I stand between you and dinner now, um, but I think this will be something that you want to listen to. I have the distinct pleasure and honor of introducing Nancy Asher, 
Um, known as many things as the first woman to ever perform a liver transplant, who I consider, as do others in the room like Peter, my mentor, teacher, colleague, office mate, and friend. Um, she's among five actually current or former presidents of the ASTS in the room. You have uh, Chapman and Osama and Peter Stock and uh, Lloyd, and, uh, but uh, Nancy did it first. Uh, she was ASTS president from 2000 to 2001. Uh, she's from Detroit, Michigan, um, but, uh, and went to the University of Michigan, proud graduate of both her undergraduate and the medical school. She was one of 20 women in the cohort of 220 and one of the two women out of that 20 to pursue surgery, and went on to complete a general surgery residency right here in Minnesota, um, as well as her clinical transplant fellowship at the University of Minnesota, and, and drove uh, the development of liver transplantation there. Named clinical director of a liver transplant program. In 1988, she was recruited to uh, UCSF uh, to build a liver transplant program. That was in 88. I joined uh, the residency shortly thereafter. Um, 1991, she was appointed uh, chief of transplant. In 1999, she was then appointed for chair uh, of the entire department, which she served for 17 years. Again, as mentioned, served as president of the ASTS, more recently as the president of the TTS, served on numerous task forces in the Department of HHS. And, served on the uh, ACOT, or the Advisory Committee on, uh, open tr uh, on, on um, Transplantation for HHS. Uh, also been invited to j join the WHO Task Force for donation and transplantation of human organs and tissues, et cetera. But she is also a living donor. She donated a kidney to her sister, and she chose to donate and have her sister uh, have her kidney transplant at UCSF. So she has a rel relatively unique experience in putting her mouth uh, where her money is, and. Uh, walking the walk and being a living donor as well as a transplant surgeon. So we all look forward to hearing our thoughts on the subject of what and why we should collect data and distribute information and data to serve the various stakeholders, including all the patients and anyone that participates in the transplant system. So thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to this group. Um, I, I, um, Rio gave you the introduction, and um, I was, my handlers told me, my handlers being John Schneider and uh, Dr. Israni and, and Rio, told me that I had to come at this from two different perspectives. The perspective of the transplant surgeon versus the patient or the patient's family. And um, I think that does give you a kind of, not any smarter, but a different idea about things. And I think it's remarkable to me that of all the things I've done, perhaps the most important thing I did was to give away that right kidney over there. You'll note that there were two arteries and uh, two veins, I'm told. And I chose a surgeon for my sister who I thought would be able to deal with the little complexities that we handed him. And of course, that's Dr. Peter Stock over there. Um, so I want to um, talk to you. No, I, I have to step back. When I start talking about you know, the minutia of data, I'm, I'm wearing the transplant surgeon's hat. When I'm talking about the real stuff, the story, I'm talking about my patient hat. And um, it's a mixture. That's who I am. So I want to give you the 30,000 foot view. I want to talk to you about you know, where I went for data, what I was looking for, maybe as a transplant professional, maybe as a family member. I want to talk to you about. Um, personal view about what I wanted at the time, personal view of what I want now, and what the SRTR maybe can help me with. So um, that's me uh, in the surgeon's outfit, and that's my sister over there, Sheila, who was a few years, five years older than me, and that, those are some of the other women in the family. Um, she's, I think she doesn't look well at that time, and that's when she moved to California when we knew she had kidney disease. And, uh, you know, when a family hears that they've got someone in their family who has a potentially fatal disease, it is alarming. Uh, we've heard from the heart transplant recipients. We've, I mean, we've heard from so many different people that it is the great equalizer when you have someone in your family who's really gravely ill. So <clears throat> the decision to, to be a donor wasn't that big a deal. Um, I made it without any data at all. But if I were to look at some data, um, you can go to the NKF, and there is a laundry list of all the bad things that can happen to you. So you can get, have pneumonia, someone could hurt your kidney on its way out, 
you can, uh, you can have a collapsed lung, you can die. You know, those things are listed, but they weren't so meaning. In fact, I ignored it. I didn't look at any of that information. You don't look at that information when you're trying to help another person. Um, you can look at the literature, and this is data from Dori Segev, uh, where they looked, uh, they took uh, the University Hospital Consortium data, and they took, uh, they took SRTR data, I guess UNOS data, OPTN data, and they looked according to um, uh, uh, the different demographics who was going to have a complication. So in fact, I guess about 16% of people who, who give a, a kidney uh, across the board have a complication, and depending on what your, your race is, you have an increased chance of having a complication. And so you can see that information there. Uh, the people with serious complications, though, are relatively rare. It's only about 2.5%. Uh, but here are all the details of the complications. Again, we're looking retrospectively. And when I went through the process, they mainly told me, well, you could die. Are you ready? You know, have you put your affairs in order? You could, have, you could die with this. And that wasn't, I mean, it's such an abstract thing for a patient or their family members to hear. It's really difficult to digest. But these are the complications that people actually care about and think about and complain about after they have been donors. And there's a whole myriad of them. And of course, I didn't pay much attention to any of that stuff at the time. Uh, this is the summary from the, the group, uh, the Segev group. And you know, I, um, Dory Segev is an interesting guy because he understands perfectly about uh, risk uh, adjustment. In fact, if you take a moribund patient, he told me, who has a 100% chance of dying with anything you do to him, you've got a success no matter what happens. If he lives, you're incredible. If he dies, it's no big deal because your comorbid conditions were so e extreme. But this is the information that he gave us. So when I went back to my handlers, Drs. Schneider and Israni and Hiroshi, I said, this is what I want. I would have liked to have something on my phone, and I'm not very phone literate or computer literate. I want to have something that will tell me what I should do, where I should go, where my family should be directed as a patient. And they said, well, we've already got that. We have that. That's exactly what the SRTR has been doing. Where have you been? And I'm a transplant professional. I've been in the field for 40 years. And uh, I, you know, I'm one of those ignorant people. So they told me about all the information, all the questions that they had received over the years. And this is a series of articles that they published between 2017 and 2021, or 2020. And it uh, is a, a lot of description of you know, how many patients asked for information, what information did they ask for, and what the SRTR has come up with to give them information about what they want to know. So here is information, on, and it's a laundry list. What, when people called SRTR, wrote to SRTR, this is what they were calling about. It's a whole host of things. Where should I go as a patient? What are the outcomes? This is the information that patients have, have asked them about. I will remind you, though, that this must have been a pretty sophisticated group of patients if they got to SRTR. And I'll bet that most patients and most families don't even know how to get, they don't even know what SRTR is, let alone contact you uh, to get uh, more information. This is the laundry list from UNOS, and you can see that thousands, they've had thousands of requests for information, but again, this is a relatively sophisticated group if they can get to UNOS. And that's, and you know, and the patients who I've met here, who I've heard here, you are at one end of the bell curve of patients that I know. This is a really a sophisticated group of, pa of patients here. Okay, um, so this is the kind of information you can get. You can plug in your, and you all know this. I didn't know it, but I know it, know it now. You can plug in your age and your BMI and your blood type, and they will tell you where you might be able to go for a kidney transplant. Uh, they will tell you the volume. They'll tell you what is going to happen to you while you're on the waiting list or what's happened to patients on a waiting list at that center and what's going to happen to you after transplant. This is an example. Uh, they also can tell you more specifics. The patients, the clinical variables in patients who, have, who are transplant candidates between years 2017 to years 2020, you know, how many of them are obese? How many of them 
uh, are older, how many of them are, uh, are a minority. They can give you all that information, they have that information, and then they can tell you according to a specific um, process wh what transplant, what percentage of transplant pa uh, centers have experience with your problem. And that's what I've heard from patients, that's what you want. You want to know how many centers actually participate in the donor exchange. How many centers actually do patients with BMIs greater than 40? How many centers do patients who, ha who are maybe A2 to Bs? That's the information you want. You also want the specifics of that program, and you want your referring doctors to have that. So the themes that they have identified among kidney patients are the following, that the patients feel that a patient-specific search it gives them more information and empowers them, that customized search uh, appears to be better than the searches they could do before, and that a custom search offers them insights into acceptance criteria. So when I looked, um, I was interested in kind of getting an idea of what programs were, uh, had a lot of experience doing live donation. And you've heard from some providers that perhaps the programs who do more live donations are, have better outcomes doing it. And you can see that the center I went to, which was University of California, San Francisco, had 146, I can't remember what year this was, live donors uh, and 220 deceased donors. So a lot of experience, a lot of activity. I wanted to go to a place where it was a factory, where they did transplants every single day. That was, that's what I wanted. <clears throat> Um, this is comparing UCSF to the other programs in California. In fact, UCSF doesn't look that great in terms of the outcome after transplant, only th three bars there. And certainly, the, this relates to patients who are waiting on the cadaver, waiting on the deceased donor waiting list. Uh, the chance of getting transplanted on the waiting list is pretty low at this center. We have thousands of patients who are waiting for transplants at our program, and we are culling the list so that we have reasonable patients as our denominator. Uh, I, as I said, I didn't pay much attention to the complications. This is me. Uh, this is my CT scan. I was actually went home on post-op day number one because I was so eager to get the hell out of the hospital. But I had to come back in the hospital with a bowel obstruction, and um, that's my bowel obstruction. I'm a little fatter then than I, than I am right now. Um, <laughs> They similarly have a tool to help liver patients, and it's quite remarkable. They can tell you, according to a, a transplant center's volume, number one, how many patients they're doing that are, uh, that are with high BMIs, how many patients are HIV positive, the donors, how many HIV positive recipients, how many hep C positive donors, hep C positive recipients. You can get all that information from SRTR if you know where to look, but it's hard to interpret the data. For me, it's hard to interpret that data. So the notion that we need a translator here, uh, I, you know, I think you guys got that message. So the theme among liver patients was very much the same, uh, where uh, in fact, and not too surprising because liver is kind of a newer field in kidney transplant, the candidates had a fair um, uh, gap in education, uh, and that came out in the liver themes, but the themes among the different uh, recipient groups are pretty much the same, and they've done the same exercise for heart and the same exercise for, for lung. Uh, but the, you know, it's, you know, your message has gotten to them, uh, loud and clear what you want. The question is where you get the data and where, you know, how we're gonna, how we're going to continue to communicate. But I have some additional thoughts about uh, what you have heard and what I learned, and these thoughts come from the perspective of both uh, a provider as well as a patient. First off, there's the, the, the practice is changing so rapidly. So if you looked in 2017 or even in 2020 at those centers that were doing liver transplant, uh, from older donors or donors who had a lot of fat in the liver or DCD donors, you would find a very small number. In fact, you heard from this morning that the number of DCDs has increased dramatically over the last five years. And with the liver assist device, with this normal uh, thermic perfusion or hypothermic perfusion, the field is changing daily. And 
Uh, I guess that's fantastic news, but the idea here is how do you get that news out to patients in real time or to practitioners in real time so that we can both avail our patients to these therapies but also learn about them ourselves. I also want to say just a couple of words about high BMI. <clears throat> so it's great if you have a high BMI to say, I want, you know, I want to find a transplant center that is going to do me at, uh, at my BMI of 40. But I think you also have to ask yourself, why do, they, why do the transplant centers really care about BMI? And what is it a surrogate for? So for example, for my sister, she had a BMI of 40. I think you got a sense of that when you saw her photograph. But the problem is that she was inactive. So I don't mind a high BMI if the patient is really active. But a high BMI in a patient who's sedentary or a patient who's not going to care for themselves in other ways is really a red flag for me. In the same vein, frailty is important, and that's a big thing in liver transplant, but it should be a big thing in all the organ transplants. Now, it's really hard to think about frailty when you've got end-stage heart disease, but the truth is that we have to have some indication of how the patients are going to care for themselves and keep themselves healthy in the long term, because that's what it, it, this is about. Um, I just got, I had to put this in because it made me so crazy. I don't understand my one-year data, and now they're, UNOS is thinking about 90-day data. So if, if we're arguing already, it's going to get even worse. <clears throat> so um, these are my thoughts. As a transplant professional, I am concerned about how my center will be perceived. And I think that Lloyd uh, alluded to that. I mean, he didn't allude to it. He said it directly. I'm a little bit defensive about my data. You know, our data and Rio, who, li who lives two doors down from me in our office suite, he tells me every day about how crummy our, uh, our, you know, our metrics are for patients on the list. We're not transplanting fast enough. We need to do more transplants. Well, goodness gracious, we're going to do 400 transplant kidney transplants this year. Uh, that's a lot. Um, as a transplant professional, I acknowledge that I don't have full understanding of the analysis. Uh, we heard from our center that perhaps we weren't noting when patients had calcification in their vessels enough, atherosclerosis. We weren't really using, we weren't, we weren't, uh, we weren't careful about putting in that comorbid condition and that that could make a giant difference in our outcome. Well, that's just one element. There must be a hundred elements that I don't understand and that my colleagues don't understand that might be important when you look at our data. And, uh, you know, I don't know how long it took Rio and his group with, with um, Transquip, you know, the NISQIP Improvement Quality Program for Transplant uh, Centers to agree on what metrics and what data they would collect, but that is really a very important effort. As a professional, I am concerned about the input of professionals in what is conveyed to the patients. So this, this tension between my quality improvement and transparency for you, and I heard from so many uh, um, uh, uh, transplant patients that they want complete transparency. But if I'm going to improve, how, you know, it, it, it really is a tension. I really need, I really need some leeway there. I, you have to help me with that. And then what I really want from the data as a transplant professional is tangible information on how I can improve my performance or my center's performance. Is it that I'm a bad surgeon? Is it that my shot selection, my patient selection is off? Is it that I don't have enough nursing staff? Is it that I'm getting late offers? I need a, a SWOT analysis of my program specifically so that I can improve, and I really do want to improve, and I think all the professionals in this room want to improve what we do for patients. As a patient and family, I, um, I love the idea of personalized information, uh, what's best for my family. But as a family unit, and I think you can't separate out the live donor who's giving to a relative from the family unit, I would have liked to know was tr at the time, I didn't want to know any of this. I just wanted to know how could we get this done before she had to go on dialysis. We did preemptive transplant. But now that time has passed and my sister has passed, um, I would have wanted to know uh, what, 
was the transplant really in her best interest? She lived three years after transplant, and was it really, it was preemptive, so we avoided dialysis. Was it really in her best interest? Um, so is the transplant wise? Should I be a donor? Uh, you know, uh, I didn't really want to know that. I, mean, I didn't want anyone telling me I couldn't be the donor, but maybe somebody should have had that discussion with me. And finally, what, what, you know, where would be the best place to do a transplant? I, you know, I, for us, that wasn't as an important an issue, with all due respect to UCSF, as these other questions. Where should the transplant be done? Um, this is a <laughs> so this is my sister after transplant. I don't think she looks too much better than she did <laughs> before <laughs> transplant, but she still wasn't taking care of herself, and her, her BMI, I think, was even higher than 40 at that time. But my sister died three years a after transplant, um, but that's all us together at Christmas. We actually have men in the family too, but this was a, <laughs> this was a, a girl picture. <clears throat> so I think the overarching themes that I've heard over the last day, because I've only been here today, are um, number one, education. So education of patients, they tell us that it empower, it does, it empowers us to hear about this stuff. It frightens us too, but it, it empowers us. But we've heard that we need education of, of the whole, of everybody, of the transplant providers as well as the patients. So the education is all around. The education of the referring doctors is, is really important. Communication, and again, this is every which way, to patients to patients, patients to the doctors, doctors to the, you know, the whole thing. We need to communicate with one another as things change. Um, we need incentivization. So we need to incentivize patients to take care of themselves. We need to incentivize donors to take care of themselves after transplant. I hated going to the doctor and having my creatinine checked, and I, you know, it's, so, so we have to figure out a way to help people want to take care of themselves. We have to incentivize providers. Uh, for example, if we want to be like Spain and use donors over the age of 70, donors up to the age of 80 for kidney transplants, then we have to use a different metric for the, in the utilization of those donors. And maybe that should be our R&D. I'm talking about deceased donors. Uh, maybe we have to get the payers to agree. These are gonna be more expensive transplants. These are gonna be longer stays in the hospitals. We've gotta you know, figure that out. And that's a project we could take on right now. And I think an, uh, the last theme I wanna talk about is the notion of trust. Um, the patients are trusting us all, from the referring doctor to all the providers uh, that are present to tell them their truth about what they can expect at their center with their, you know, with their exchange. And, but we also are trusting the patients to do their part in this, to tell us when they are running out of medicines, to tell us when they can't afford their medicines. So th those are the um, thoughts I'll leave you with. I hope you weren't expecting any answers from me, but <laughs> I really appreciate an opportunity to talk with you. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, I, I had one, right. I wanna, um, I wanna plug the goal uh, of understanding how many people could benefit the burden of disease goal. And maybe that's not SRTR, but someone in government, someone's gotta help us figure that out. We have 330 million people in the United States, 14% incidence of renal failure, yet we only have 800,000 people on dialysis or with transplant, so there's like, Two million people were missing someplace, and I don't know where they are. In the same vein, we have, I don't know, 600,000 people with cirrhosis, and how many of them get referred for transplants? So when we're talking about equity, and we're talking about the underserved, we've got to understand burden of disease. And we go across the world bragging about how great the U.S. system is, and we are missing a, you know, a majority of the patients who need organ replacement. That's my plug. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank Nancy. I think that's an appropriate closer for um, today. And uh, I want to encourage you to please come back tomorrow and with your thoughts about how we're going to accomplish some of these things that we talked about. But I want to uh, thank Nancy again for her thoughts. So thanks for a great day, everybody. John, did you want to ha have any uh, housekeeping items or anything like that? Or moderators. Do you want to? Okay. So 
uh, for all the moderators that helped uh, uh, Cedar Room at 6 o'clock for a, a meeting to talk about uh, today. So thank you very much. Thank you.